Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and this is our first edition of True Crime South Africa Spotlight. These mini-episodes will be in addition to our usual case episodes, and will feature snippets of true crime cases which have recently made news. I'll also use this platform to discuss any updates on the cases we've discussed so far. For those of you who follow our Facebook page, you'll remember that I posted a little while back about South Africa's ranking in terms of the number of serial killers in the country on an international scale. Frighteningly, we rank third. The statistic was taken by measuring the number of recorded serial killers since the 1900s. The United States topped the scale with 2,500 serial killers. The UK has had 145 and South Africa has had 112. Well, if recent media articles are to be believed, we could add another two to our tally. In Mukilneek, Pretoria, five homeless people have been stabbed to death in the space of just three weeks. Police have yet to officially label the series a serial killing, but are referring to the killer as the Nocturnal Prowler. Naturally, the homeless in the area are absolutely terrified and have taken to sleeping during the day so that they can be alert at night. The motive for the killings is unclear because many of the victims have been found with their valuables, cell phones, a small amount of money and the like, still on them. So it's not robbery. Gerard Labuskagny, the former head of the SAPS Investigative Psychology Unit, has speculated that it could be some form of personal retribution, where the killer feels he may have been wronged by a homeless person in the past and is now seeking to get revenge. On the 28th of June, a suspect was arrested in the stabbing attack of a homeless man in the same area. Police have yet to confirm that he is linked to the other attacks, but I certainly hope for the sake of these already vulnerable people that the nocturnal prowler is in fact behind bars. The other serial killer case, which has been in the news recently, is out of Mpumalanga, where a missing person investigation led police to a 25-year-old Tabise Mdawe, who proceeded to admit to not only having murdered the woman that they were looking for, but also four other women. Mdawe, who has been dubbed the Facebook killer, would engage with his victims on social media, arrange to meet with them, and then rape and murder them. All five bodies were recovered in his backyard. His victims were aged between 15 and 24. Unfortunately, the enraged community in which Mdawe lived, on being alerted to the discoveries, torched his home in protest. This is quite a common way for communities in South Africa to show their disdain for perpetrators of crime, but it is terribly misguided. Not only is it very possible that those houses don't even belong to the suspects, but rather to their parents or other family members, who probably weren't even aware of the suspect's crimes, but it's also destroying evidence. Police need to be able to forensically analyse the scene of the crime in order to build an airtight case against Mdawi, and if he retracts his confessions, it could result in him being let back out into their community. Yes, they found the bodies in his backyard, but without tying the victims to having been inside the house, he could easily argue that someone else killed them and dumped them in his backyard. The neighbor's anger may be partially rooted in the fact that Ndawe sold vegetables in the neighborhood which he grew in his backyard. The same backyard where he had five bodies buried. He is now in custody and awaiting a bail hearing. I've been following the Facebook page of missing South African teacher John Bodma, who disappeared in Vietnam in May this year. John, 22, from Gauteng, was last seen in Ho Chi Minh City on the 18th of May 2019, and he then disappeared without a trace. His family set up the Facebook page, Bring John Home, to try and bring awareness to his case. On the 20th of July, News24 reported the disappearance of a second South African teacher in the same city. Mushfiq Daniels is 28 and from Cape Town. He has been in Vietnam since March 2018, 
his family last spoke to him on the 3rd of July, and his disappearance was officially reported on the 7th of July. The article states that Mushfiq had been in Indonesia in June, but officials there claim that he was deported, presumably back to Vietnam, after a public disturbance incident involving Mushfiq at a mosque. His family have stated that they do feel he may have been in a disturbed state of mind at the time of his disappearance. A Facebook page has also been set up to create awareness for Mushfiq's disappearance. In a shocking case of violation of duty, a former state specialist forensic pathologist, Dr. James Moesigua, was found guilty and sentenced to 10 years in jail this week for stealing organs from a dead body. It was found that Moesigua had illegally removed several internal organs from the body of a leader, Skirpus, who was killed in a car accident. He was arrested in 2013 after trying to walk out of his place of work with a bucket filled with organs. Ridiculously, he remained on paid suspension for almost two years and in that time was paid 1.5 million rand in salary. That begs the question, what was he going to be paid for those organs that made it worth his while if he was already earning such a large salary? He eventually resigned from his position in 2015 while still awaiting trial. A Ukrainian tourist was robbed of his belongings and sadly stabbed to death in Hout Bay recently. Ivan Ivanov, 44, a father of three, was on business in South Africa and extended his trip so that he could spend the weekend at leisure in his beautiful surroundings. He was hiking near Chapman's Peak on a Saturday morning in July when he was accosted, attacked and robbed by three men, one of which was out on bail for attacking a legal wise attorney in court. The attackers fled the scene, leaving Ivan bleeding on the trail. One suspect was apprehended by a community policing forum member who saw that he was covered in blood and had a backpack which did not appear to be his. The CPF member obviously had no idea that this man had just murdered someone, so in order to try and track down the owner of the backpack, he dialed the last number on the cell phone and got through to Ivan's oldest son. Sadly, this was how Ivan's family found out that something had gone very wrong on his trip. The suspects have appeared in court and are being held in custody. That is it for our first edition of True Crime South Africa Spotlight. I am squirreling away at episode 6 and I hope to have it out within a week. As always, please be sure to join in on our discussions on our social media pages including Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. True Crime South Africa has been running since the 22nd of June and we've had an amazing launch period. We are currently charting at number 36 on Spotify and number 14 on the True Crime section of Apple Podcasts for South Africa. I could not have done this without you, our amazing listeners who have shared and invited your like-minded friends. Please continue to do so, so that we can build an even greater voice for our South African victims. Chat to you soon. Hold up. 